Next up, we have Josh DiVincento from the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Earth Institute at Columbia. Um, so the National Center of Disaster Preparedness seems to be the place um, to come from to talk about COVID. And it's gonna talk about early methods for teaching about COVID-19 in vivo after an action report from developing and implementing COVID-19 recovery to resilience. So there's a course on that. So a lot to talk about and a lot to hear about it. And I'm interested in hearing all about it. So Josh, great to have you here. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you if you wanna share your screen and take, take the mic and go from there. Thank you, David. Thank you to all the organizers, the reviewers uh, for having us here. Um, and I'll be speaking on behalf of my, my center. I can't say this was a sole effort in designing this course. Um, but my name is Josh DiVincenzo, as, as was mentioned before. Uh, I am from the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. So we've had a busy uh, year and a half or so here um, uh, navigating the pandemic environment, especially from an education um, and, and curriculum development standpoint. And I understand we have a diverse um, uh, net of, of people that attend this conference on both the higher education, but then also the workforce. So I do hope that there are some um, different sound bites in here that might be useful for you in your context. Uh, so today's presentation, I'm gonna take up um, just a few minutes, uh, um, about 25 minutes or so, uh, talking about some of the things that we learned, um, and then of course, open it up for any Q&A that might uh, be there and discuss a little bit more, but really looking at the early methods for teaching about COVID-19 in vivo, kind of in the action of doing it. Um, and uh, a lot of these findings come from our after action report from developing a course called COVID-19 Recovery to Resilience. Um, so we'll move on here. I have a few aims. Uh, I'm going to go over a brief overview of the curriculum itself. And this is really uh, for any folks that are going to be tasked with talking about the pandemic um, afterwards, um, during it, um, and in your organization settings or in your classroom. So if there's anything that you see in the curriculum, I invite you to uh, take from it, uh, to take those themes and build them out in, in whatever context means um, the most for, you, for, your, for your group. And then I will talk a little bit about the learning theories, specifically of what we had to kind of rely on for a lot of the instructional design decisions that we made early on. Uh, some of the after action um, uh, findings and, and understanding from our learners, and then talk about some uh, next steps for um, where we're headed with some COVID-19 curriculum um, and what, we're, what we've currently been engaged with and some of the key focal focus areas that came out from creating this curriculum initially. Um, just some quick disclosures. I'm really a fan of um, more presenters uh, being able to provide these disclosures just so you understand our vantage points and some of the biases and then you call us out on some of the biases from our perspectives. Um, but I'm a senior instructional designer at NCDP. So a lot of my day to day is designing these types of curriculum primarily uh, prior to the pandemic focusing on uh, post disaster economic and housing recovery um, across the uh, United States. Uh, I'm also a fourth year doctoral student in, at Teachers College at Columbia University, where I focus primarily on adult learning. So a lot of my theory decisions and cur curation, as you'll see, come from adult learning theory. Uh, and I focus uh, primarily on cognitive science and creating pedagogy for climate change. Um, my background is in business as well as in education policy. And I, again, uh, closely affiliated with the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, which has a long history in public health, uh, as well as disaster uh, recovery response and preparedness, uh, which, was, which you will see very much so reflected in uh, how our curriculum was built out and some of the knowledge that we were able to tap into immediately, which put us into a very unique position to create this course. Also getting situated for today's discussion, I, I want to address that um, each one of these gears uh, in its own right could stand alone as its own talk, uh, really looking at COVID-19 in general um, and uh, the, from a public health vantage point, whatever it might be. But uh, I also want to put on people's radar, uh, especially from a learning uh, design standpoint, the importance of the individual biographies. Uh, even if you're teaching and engaging with a learner today or beyond and in the future, understanding that they have a very individualized uh, experience through this pandemic. And these are things that we need to be mindful of uh, when we are bringing up uh, and teaching to COVID-19 in our classrooms, our workplace settings. And something that we found as kind of an emergent gear here um, throughout teaching this course uh, was policy and policy literacy and equipping our learners to be able to navigate um, policy and understand uh, what was coming out uh, from terms of guidance at local, state, uh, and federal levels around the pandemic and uh, navigating information. So today's conversation is really going to look at how these three gears uh, interact with one another. So taking into account the pandemic as this phenomena, uh, the individual biographies, what our learners were coming uh, to the, the, um, the training, to the course with, already understanding and wanting to learn. 
as well as the communities they represent. And then of course the policy and policy literacy that's going to continually continuously be a characterization of how we talk about this, uh, this pandemic in our learning settings. Uh, so for some context, uh, and again, I think this is uh, kind of makes this presentation a little bit um, distinct from others is that this course uh, was commissioned uh, by Columbia University's Earth Institute in the professional learning non-degree um, during the pandemic, fall of 2020. Uh, so it was COVID-19 recovery to resilience was going to be the, the title of this course, and it ran from October 7th, to November 4th, all virtual of course. Um, but it did put one of the most unique and probably once in a lifetime uh, instructional design opportunities on on my desk in terms of thinking about what type of materials, how do we engage our learners in a meaningful way beyond uh, solely uh, knowledge dump, and most importantly, the a, a massive characteristics of this in vivo theme changing information each week and engaging learners in that. So we did rely heavily on learning theories to think about uh, how we can go on uh, beyond just solely empirical information, but also talk about the lived experience of learners as well as for, as an instructor, um, very much so a reflective exercise for myself uh, navigating the pandemic. So I'm going to uh, kind of talk through the design strategy for this. And again, uh, it's with hopes where we are today that you can take some of this information, anything that is useful for you uh, and, and kind of carry with carry it uh, forward um, and, and incorporate it into your classrooms and workplace settings. Um, to begin with, uh, and also another uh, opportunity to situate where this curriculum sat, um, this is a disaster continuum. This might be, and again, the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. So we have a lot of these models, a lot of these figures and vis visuals that have shaped and informed our practice for a very long time uh, with primarily climatological disasters, um, but very applicable for making sense and bringing uh, the general public up to um, speed when, uh, when we had kind of this globally felt and still have this globally felt pandemic. Um, so you can see on the continuum, a lot of these preparedness actions, of course, can happen prior to a disaster. The disaster occurs. You have some of the short term. Um, and then where this course kind of was developed was what we would call in this intermediate, the weeks or months following kind of the disaster. Uh, and when we say the disaster and the pandemic, even that asks us to pressure some of our older definitions as um, it's really hard to pinpoint a specific day. But let's let's just uh, think about when it was kind of on the national radar as kind of the start of that disaster. So months later, uh, we're developing this course and really where this is going to be beneficial for most people that are engaging in this talk today is this long term, the years. So what are the years ahead look like when we talk about COVID-19? Can we continue to use this as a, a as a excellent learning point in time and history to talk about some of the more embedded social uh, impacts of the pandemic and make sure that we don't lose sight of that across all of our uh, uh, subsets of society and um, really work from there and, and, and gear towards this long term. But this course, again, just to iterate, it was developed in the intermediate of this disaster continuum. Um, I've attended a lot of conversations in uh, the, this conference this uh, past few days and uh, hearing the themes of COVID-19, I put this table together really briefly just to organize um, some of the thoughts here, but kind of showing where what we're talking about here, um, as opposed to some uh, of the other angles and perspectives. Uh, I feel feel free to build this table out more uh, if anybody wants to uh, look at this trend, because I do think it is going to be something that characterizes a lot of presentations in the future. But we do have kind of conversations of uh, in a retroactive stage of uh, talking about COVID-19 and before times and what could we what we could have done better in terms of teaching and learning in workplace or in higher ed. We also have people talking about other subjects, teaching other subjects or uh, more of like institutional and the before times that we now know now uh, post pandemic. And I put post pandemic here in parentheses as we know we're not necessarily post pandemic yet. Um, and then we have uh, post pandemic teaching and learning about COVID-19. And then we also have uh, ramifications of modality and a lot of really important conversations of post pandemic on other subjects and, and education in general. My talk um, is really gonna be focused primarily on teaching about the pandemic itself in these post pandemic environments. Um, but in the in vivo setting, when this was all occurring, this is really where it was all the locus was. So it was kind of everywhere um, all at once and eventually settling here. So talking about teaching and learning about the pandemic and uh, beyond the post pandemic settings. Um, so just organizing where we're focused here. This is another example of kind of the in vivo characteristics. 
Uh, you can see this was as of October 14th, uh, 2020. Um, one thing that we had to make sure that all our learners uh, had was kind of an up-to-date briefing of all the information that changed that one week. Uh, so it encouraged our instructors and as well to be very in tune with what was happening. And it, this is just a quick, I'll click through it. Um, each week we kind of updated this with some of the headlines, the case counts, uh, to really drive in the home that everything was changing, the landscape was changing. Uh, mind you, at this point in the year of 2020, uh, this was far bef uh, before any type of idea of a vaccination rollout was uh, occurring. So tracking what was happening on, uh, on the Capitol, all these different things here, um, making sure our learners were equipped to understand and are, were tracking along with us and, as long, and kept us accountable to be tracking this information as well. Um, don't want to spend too much time here, but you kind of get the idea that uh, this was a unique circumstance where all of our learners as well as instructors had to be briefed on a weekly basis. And I would say this is a healthy habit even today to continue this type of briefing if you are going to begin talking about the pandemic um, in your settings. So the different course modules and topics that we uh, curated here, there were five major categories and it really was reliant on um, what we knew and some of the literature we could depend on from disaster management and other disasters, whether it was Hurricane Katrina to Hurricane Maria, um, earthquakes and wildfires, and incorporating that to what we know from the social systems that play after a disaster, during a disaster, et cetera. So uh, we started off with mapping and expanding the field of disaster management in the context of COVID-19. Luckily, we had access to many public health uh, officials that were uh, leading voices throughout the pandemic uh, that could uh, weigh in and, and teach to the, the science behind the pandemic uh, from more of that public health lens. Uh, we wanted to focus on the systems thinking approach. So we incorporated uh, community lifelines and recovery timelines. We uh, assumed that there would be a learning curve with the, the, the time scales of disasters. So really focusing on that disaster continuum. We do see that now where I, I think uh, we, we have a hesitancy to think that it's immediately over and where we see where we kind of um, maybe neglect those indirect impacts that trickle and will characterize our, our, our society and our country uh, in the long term disaster uh, recovery phases. So we want to make sure our learners are equipped with that and uh, kind of understood why there wasn't necessarily an immediacy to recovery with something as complex as a global pandemic. Um, three, we talked about the lasting impacts and onward again. So talking about what the future landscape would mean. And then four, if there's one thing to take away from this talk and incorporate into uh, any type of uh, experience around these topics would be uh, a focus on high risk underserved vulnerable populations in disasters. And this is a, has been a long standing theme of disasters in general. We have plenty of examples to pull from. Uh, the pandemic, of course, exasperated this and made it uh, incredibly apparent to folks to, to witness, especially uh, for folks that were based in New York City. We kind of could see this uh, uh, in, with a front row view of the different inequalities that happened throughout the pandemic and uh, making sure that our learners could kind of dissect those from a historical lens to, to also make sense for what was happening now with, uh, of course, the hope in the future that we could uh, mitigate some of these and improve the overall social system there. Uh, and then five, there was we noticed a, a kind of a learning ca uh, gap, and one of the learning objectives we wanted for this course was just overall understanding of communications across federal, state, local, and general public. This kind of goes back and is a nudge towards civics education, but more so that we saw, especially for some of the folks that are engaged here in the tech communities, uh, of a strong call out to digital literacies and being able to navigate the different uh, news and uh, different uh, information sources that were out there throughout the pandemic, especially with so much screen time. I think that the, the talk uh, prior to this was making a great point of uh, amount of screen time that uh, folks uh, have found themselves on uh, during these times. This is just an example module. Um, so going through and really picking apart uh, all the complexities here. So focusing on, on children disasters, elderly, homeless, um, poor communities, relative rules. So looking at some of the theory bases uh, behind this, um, uh, Black and Latinx communities, Indigenous people, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism racism in recovery and resilience. So uh, really making sure that it goes beyond just the pandemic, the virus uh, itself, and looks at some of these um, things that kind of situated us for what was to unfold over time. Uh, of course, we wanted to be cognizant of where our instructors as well as our learners were going to be coming from. Uh, so we tapped into, this was an excellent piece, uh, a very recent piece on uh, social and behavioral science relevant during a pandemic. Uh, we were aware that as an instructor, uh, we might succumb to some of these, uh, if not all of these. And then our learners were also coming into our classrooms or into our, our virtual classrooms uh, with uh, many of these um, 
these traits. So, and you can see uh, if you go, if you're thinking back to those five modules we curated, they really try to tap into each of these as much as possible. So talking about the social con uh, context, the inequalities, the culture, the political polarization, going back to that digital literacy piece, talking about conspiracy theories, fake news, persuasion, um, talking about the leadership. So what, what, uh, what makes a good crisis leader and talking about uh, social isolation. We're going to see a really unfortunate and sad example of this uh, in a few moments, um, but with also some hopeful messages towards the end there. Um, but looking at the importance of intimate relationships, healthy mindsets, uh, a lot going on both in our learners' minds, but then also our minds as we uh, all were kind of collectively uh, navigating this pandemic. Some of the theories that informed your design, and I don't think, um, unfortunately, for sake of time, we're not going to be able to give a, a a just treatment to all these theories. I'm going to focus primarily on concept mapping, but just for folks that are uh, looking to take away things to apply to their curriculum, here are five of the theories that really informed our practice. Uh, so concept mapping, uh, systems thinking very closely uh, linked to the concept mapping theme. Action learning was more or less the foundational theory for us, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Self-directed learning and then uh, really uh, a lot of pressure and importance of learning from experience uh, and, and looking towards tapping into the experience of all of our learners and instructors uh, to make sense of this and uh, go and uh, move towards meaning making. Uh, action learning, of course, and uh, it's been funny, I have a few conferences I've seen, this is becoming a very common threat uh, trend uh, and theme in how people have approached their pedagogy. Uh, you can see it's nothing new. Um, this is kind of the seminal work for action, uh, action learning in 1982, but action learning is a means of development, intellectual, emotional, or physical that requires its participants uh, through responsible involvement in some real complex and stressful problem, in this case the pandemic, to achieve intended change to improve their observable behavior in the problem field. Uh, in a, in a much simpler way, uh, this is kind of the equation or the symbolic equation of what this is getting at. Learning is equally equals uh, program knowledge from the past, so their own experiences, what we knew from disasters that we could kind of integrate into the curriculum and questioning insights and understanding that some of these definitions that we were using so heavily indoctrinated through time uh, needed to be questioned in the context of the pandemic. And uh, hopefully what that will uh, direct us to is improvement in, in kind of our foundational knowledge around some of these disasters, some of the consequences of, of disasters here. But even for our students, um, looking at just a whole new world landscape here through action learning for all of us. This was also a key um, component of being re, uh, proactive around changing information. So as information changed, uh, we can kind of fall back on this equation to, to uh, kind of construct meaning together as a, as a group here. It took some humu humility from the instructor's lens to understand that uh, not all that information was out there, that we did not know everything, and we had to really be one-on-one um, -on -one with our learners to kind of level set that uh, we are going to uh, create this type of inquiry together. Uh, this is kind of a, this is a quote that came out of King County, Washington. King County, Washington was one of the first uh, counties in the United States that unfortunately had a casualty due to the, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Um, and uh, we were there in June 2020 and uh, virtually um, and um, one of the uh, participants raised their hand and uh, the virtual hand and said, are we in response, recovery, resilience? Can we be in a combination of all of them? It's hard to say where we are today. And this was a quote that really characterized our instructional design team for the rest and to today of, uh, you know, how, how heavily can we rely on these definitions of these frameworks uh, where this pandemic has really confused a lot of what we, uh, what we depend on from a knowledge base. Uh, so we really changed and, and looked towards what experiences were, what information was available and how we could uh, create learning that way. Uh, but this again is just a very powerful quote uh, that uh, really was a call to action for us to think back to our frameworks, to revisit curriculum and, and, and um, embrace kind of the in vivo phenomena of talking about and teaching to the pandemic during the pandemic. Uh, resilience itself, it's a definition that's been uh, thrown around uh, since uh, the, um, the late 70s and probably before then even uh, the concepts. Uh, so it's been these things that we've relied on these definitions for such a long time with our learners, uh, but we really need to find a good definition of what this resilience meant uh, in the context of the pandemic with all that we knew now. Um, we encourage our learners to move to um, uh, resilience as a, a conceptualization of a process rather than an outcome, especially for at the time in the fall when we we're teaching this class, um, the finish line seemed very, very ambiguous at that point. Um, and uh, so for, for, for us, it was kind of a sign of hope that we could talk about resilience and more of this, of this process and, and less of an outcome and something that we could take uh, into the future. 
Um, we also, as I mentioned before, put a, uh, much of a focus on poor communities and talking about why um, you might be witnessing such a discrepancy in uh, access to resources throughout the pandemic, understanding um, from different vantage points, perspective taking and, and uh, relying on some of the theories there um, and uh, making sure our learners are aware of uh, beyond their ind individual biography, there is that collective biography um, that we need to account for to, if we're taking a holistic picture here of the phenomenon of the pandemic. This is all to say that we were very cognizant of uh, the theater of knowing. I think this is an excellent little illustration here, of, of course, a little bit more complex than this, but at the same time, uh, being aware that our learners were being inundated uh, with concepts, images, descriptions, insights, ideas um, what, through several modalities. Um, but what we wanted to focus our curriculum on and I encourage uh, for folks to focus the curriculum, curriculum on, on talk, talking about these themes of COVID-19 are the emotions, the analogies, the models, the narratives, the different imageries, the concept maps, the connections that learners were able to make um, of what was going on in a very real, real crisis and complexity. Uh, the one theory that I'm going to touch upon, and I'm keeping an eye on the time because I do want to keep uh, and respect the time and hopefully uh, field a couple questions here, um, is the concept map. Uh, more or less, the concept map is a graphical tool for organizing and representing knowledge. They include concepts and relationships between those concepts by connecting the a line between the two. Um, importantly, with the pandemic, we, we found that uh, folks actually had a very tough time with the connections. And that is something uh, and a call for instructors that are looking to leverage concept maps uh, is to facilitate the connections between different topics. Uh, there was no shortage of listing out the, the, the properties, the features that they were uh, top of mind when they thought of uh, the pandemic itself. But those connections and uh, moving from that, knowing what to knowing how was where we saw a lot more of the confusion and needed for some assistance. Um, these are just some examples of moving from kind of a simple model to the more elaborate. This is what the one on the right here is what we kind of wanted to work uh, towards was that more like the if then knowledge of knowing how. Um, but this is these next two slides are examples of the concept maps that we did uh, actually get from the course. Uh, the strategy we did for this was on the very first day we asked folks to begin the concept map um, and they kind of listed things that they were thinking about in a very unique way. It was very reflective of their own uh, professional experiences or their own world and it uses a very it's, it's a very nice uh, diagnostic tool of where your learners are going to be at when talking about the pandemic. Uh, so you saw some things surface and then on the very last day uh, we went back to the, to the concept map and asked them to uh, hopefully build out a more elaborate model um, based on some of the themes that we talked about. But you can see here we did focus on child care, child first approaches here, uh, communication at all levels. So some of that citizen science that we're talking about there, uh, communication, uh, government guidelines. We did uh, focus primarily on that, um, some calls to the vaccine, et cetera. Uh, this one is a very unique one. Uh, so we did a concept map uh, with a K through 12 school. Um, so there's several uh, contributors on this one. Um, and you can see here uh, a lot of uh, connections being made. This was a little bit later on uh, on the pandemic timeline, but you can see the future, resources, lifestyle, environment, family, home. And then if you're leading one of these trainings in a workplace, a K through 12 or higher ed, this is again, another insight into the minds of your students, uh, something that we took away. And some of the teachers that were engaged in this uh, activity also uh, took note of was over here in mental health. We saw so many call outs from the, from the students. And of course, it's all anonymous. Um, uh, loneliness and isolation, need for social interaction, loneliness, loneliness, depression, isolation, lack of control, isolation. And uh, I don't need to bring the point home more, but this was something, of course, that as an educator or are looking to create these learning experiences uh, around would want to be aware of and, and want to take account of this is how um, the individual biographies of these students is being shaped by the pandemic itself. So that was just one tool. There's a plenty of other tools that I uh, would be happy to share with folks. I'll have my contact information on the next slide here. Um, one other was an emergent theme that came about uh, from this course was understanding that folks wanted to understand and be able to distinguish between uh, uh, disinformation and misinformation. Uh, so this was one game that we used uh, with our learners just so that they can gauge uh, the different um, types of media that's out there uh, the different, and see it from different angles. You are actually in this game, you take the perspective of someone that is trying to get um, disinformation or misinformation to trend. Uh, so they're really seeing it from a different angle, but uh, at, the, at the core of it uh, was one of those emergent themes in vivo of, of what our learners wanted to be more equipped with when making sense of the pandemic. And I think this will also be kind of one of those continuous uh, themes that we'll see 
Next steps, really knowledge share. I think uh, we are all very much so teaching the pandemic. And I know I framed this presentation as something that's very unique to because we were asked to do this in fall of 2020, but we are all very much so still teaching COVID-19 in vivo as it's going on. Uh, I hope there was some uh, useful information, some perspectives here, um, some ideas that might have uh, come about from uh, what we learned and how we curated this course. Um, but really the take home point and uh, the one that I want to leave here with before I open up for a, a question or two um, is a focus on global perspectives and awareness for other parts of the world. Uh, so for us, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm situated here in New York and, and for us, um, understanding that uh, despite what we have a lot of reopening signals and that we have an idea of uh, moving back to normality, understanding that definition of normality uh, for many folks around the world might mean uh, still struggling to make uh, ends meet, to make, uh, to have resources uh, to survive, um, but more so uh, a call to action. And I'm, I'm open to hearing any ideas from folks. If you want to like, if you want to collaborate on this, is how we can equip our learners, our, our employees, with this global perspective to take into account, despite what's going on, uh, potentially out our front door or outside of our building, uh, the, uh, the the pandemic is still roaring on with a very dramatic effect in other parts of the world. Um, and we want to make sure our learners are engaged and connected to that. So that's really the next step for this COVID-19 curriculum where we're headed um, is having that global awareness and understanding uh, some of the implications of that. Um, with that, uh, this is my email address, uh, jld2225 at columbia.edu, uh, my Twitter handle, um, and then here is a link to Columbia's Earth Institute if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about our work or seeing some of our work and we have some resources out there. Um, but I want to appreciate everybody for their time. Again, this is a call for collaboration on this curriculum, very much so in, in, in action and in vivo. So um, looking forward to hearing from folks. And uh, thank you again for your time. And thank you to the Learning Ideas Conference for engaging in this conversation. So appreciate it. All right, fantastic. Oh, thank, thanks so much. We've got time for a couple of questions. So if you want to fill up questions, you can uh, type them in the, the chat or the Q&A or you know, tell us you want to talk and we can can allow you to talk the way Zoom and the webinar is set up. Um, while we have a second, so one, one question just from me, um, it seems like you had a really broad audience to this. I just want to kind of clarify who the people were that you were looking to, you know, that you intended as the audience and maybe if there were other people who added themselves to the audience that you didn't expect. Yeah, I think uh, we've seen it across different stakeholders so far. We, I mean, we've had to work and teach about the pandemic early, early on with anything from K through 12 to, and a lot of the stuff that we do uh, for their um, economic recovery, for example, is the private sector. So we work with organizations and the public sector as well. So it really spans anybody really for the audience that is looking to talk about these themes and encourage that this is a, a learning um, um, event uh, beyond just the kind of the recent um, the recent future. You know, So if, for organizations that want to talk about the pandemic, what they did during the pandemic, these are some strategies for that. Like I said, it's kind of related to that, I think maybe just, just between certain subsets of your audience, but did you, did you find yourself having to worry about and design for the emotional state of the audience? Like given that this is just a really, you know, unprecedented situation and you're talking about exactly that situation. So were there things you had to incorporate into the course to, you know, to, to sort of, uh, yeah, to account for that, to make people's lives more comfortable, to make their experience more comfortable? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think it really is gonna rely on the facilitator and their willingness to kind of be uh, humble in the information that they have and their expertise. Um, so immediately when they wanted a kind of a crash lecture on the public health from a, um, um, the public health aspects of the virus, I tapped into an expert. So knowing my own limitations as well, but also gaining trust with the group that you're working with early on. So uh, our first two lectures, no recording of it at all. Uh, just kind of sharing with uh, learners where I was coming from throughout the virus, where they're coming from. And uh, really that relationship building piece was the only way we could kind of move on with this type of uh, training. Makes sense. So we'll talk about one last quick question from Imogen, which is, can you say something about tempo and pace? So how did it feel developing and delivering learning, uh, I guess, during this time? Tempo and pace. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think as again, going back on, as the instructor, you kind of had to slow down the pace, um, but internally in the preparation for each of the modules, uh, the pace felt like it was going 120 miles per hour because the information was changing so quickly. I get a ping notification from a news outlet that all of a sudden this was occurring in, in our region and understanding like I wanted to bring that up in my class the next, the next afternoon. So in terms of pacing, it did feel uh, a lot faster, but you had to kind of 
bring it down slower for the people that were uh, kind of engaging with this information. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, I can I can imagine Im images as you can imagine as well. So fantastic. Well, we're uh, out of time, but uh, obviously hope we have the chance to talk more about this and people can reach out to you and uh, really enjoy this. And thanks for thanks for uh, taking the time to talk with us today. And uh, hope we'll, we'll be able to stick around through the uh, rest of the week. So great. Thanks again, Josh. I really appreciate it. No Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.